I bought new lenses. Already? I can't help myself. I mean, that's all you do is buy and sell and lose lenses. I mean, I have I try not to buy more than like one or two lenses a year. And and you, and how, how many lenses have you bought this year? And, and I don't think that uh, I really could justify having more than like three or four total lenses realistically. And this year I bought one, two, three, four. Crap, hold on, I lost counting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, counting to four is pretty hard. <laughs> one, two, three. So those, those three plus the one that I, I didn't keep, which is four, and then five. I think I've bought six lenses this year. That That's about twice as many as you said you could justify owning. So what's the deal with that? <laughs> well, I mean, let's, let's not get into all of it. But I did get a really sweet deal on a 16 millimeter 1.4. Okay, that I could not I could not say no to recently. I found a used one on on the Facebook for like 450 bucks. So, on the Facebook. Yep, and uh, yeah, I love that lens. And I it came in and it came with one of those uh, Moment Cine Bloom 10 uh, percent okay. filters, and uh-huh. I hadn't had a chance to play with one of those. So that's a nice had bonus. A, had a cool filter, you know, 60 dollar filter. And then uh, the lens is in really good shape. Put it on my camera, and I was like, I remember why I love this lens. <laughs> the real question is, has it come off your camera since you got it? I mean, it has because I bought that other lens. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's... Uh, I just... I love the 16 so much. I don't know if it's the fact that if I'm taking a picture of something, I'm never, like, too close to it. Like, you can be kind of too far away, and, you know, you get this really wide look. Mm. But the the picture out of that, out of that lens just... It's like something with the way that it produces contrast and the close focus distance. And I don't know. It's just something special about that lens. Just makes you feel special inside. I just, I love it. It's so good. It's so good. Well, I'm glad the prodigal lens has returned. Yep. Finally, I've officially bought that lens two times (laughs) and I pray I don't have to buy it a third. Yep. Yep. Two ought to be enough for anybody. Oh boy. And then I decided to... That I'm gonna sell my Viltrox 85, okay, and buy the 80 millimeter macro lens. And I think we talked about that back and forth a little while ago, as far as like one to one being true macro and all the pretentious macro people. Yeah, Sorry. I think we did discuss that. Anyway, so I I decided to like you know the portrait stuff is maybe second tier. Wanted to try macro lens. This is kind of the best macro lens that Fuji makes and I was like I don't want to buy the 60 and then be and then be like oh you know this is really cool I like this lens but I sure wish that I had you know spent a little more got the 80 and I have a I have the 30 and the 85 and so it was like do I buy the 30 2.8 or the 80 2.8 for the macro and like which one do I replace so went for the 80 and that lens is that lens is something else man so is that lens 1.1 one, one? the lens is 1.1 one, one. And you can you can get you can get so freaking close to that front <laughs> element. I think the lens is like six inches long, and the minimal focal distance is like eight inches or something. And then so you, like you can get almost touching the glass. If okay. you put the lens hood on there, you can get like into the lens hood. Nice. It's it's pretty cool. And I kind of underestimated how much I would like that part of it because usually whenever I have the eighty five on, and I'm like, oh, I just kind of I'm just snapping pictures like i'm at home just kind of taking pictures everything's too close yeah well because that 85 you have doesn't focus very close to it like you have to be pretty far away yeah and that's not uncommon i mean Mm -hmm. you have something that's like 85 is going to focus whatever five feet away or something and so being able to focus up to two inches away (laughs) has opened up a whole new world of not even just like not not even macro things Mm -hmm. but you know, and now I'm taking a picture of something that's three feet away, and it's like, huge. Yep. And uh, that's that's yeah. been a lot of fun. But look, that's the cool thing about photography is like getting these different perspectives on the world around you and taking pictures and blah blah blah. And like the wideness of the 16 and like the narrowness of the 80 have been like they're totally different things. Yeah. But the thing I guess that they have in common is that they can both focus really close, mm-hmm. and it gives you the uh, ability to shoot things that you, you you couldn't with other lenses i mean what i'm hearing is that you like to be uncomfortably close to everything you shoot it does seem like there's a common theme yeah yeah it really does but it may, maybe it's just that's the the two lenses that i have and, and maybe so the two plus the other however many you you have that you bought this year oh boy so yeah um if anyone's if anyone's looking for it <laughs> i'm selling an 85 uh viltrox 1.8 <laughs> for xf mount 
Have you gotten the chance to test that OIS in the 80? Because that's one thing that I saw about that lens. It seemed nice. I haven't really had a chance to do some video testing with it. It does pretty well when you're doing like macro stuff. If you're trying to get like all up on a flower mm, and all shoot, up on a flower, yeah, just all up in there and you're shooting it like, you know, F16 and you are just fighting that shallow depth of field. Like, yeah, it helps. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I, I, I've heard that's a really good lens. I've heard it's really sharp. I mean, it just seems like, yeah, I could it, get it's, some, it's, it's expensive, but it seems like a, a really good buy. It's super expensive. But um, as we'll probably discuss later with uh, Canon glass, it's actually surprisingly cheap for <sighs> what it is. And it the like the, the OIS, I mean, I could shoot, I was shooting like one over 10 shutter speed at F, I don't know, so like F13, F16, you know, two inches, three inches away. And, and I could get a sharp exposure. And like the, the sharpness is like, I was shooting, I shot some pictures of the dogs at like ISO 6400, you know, and it's a little grainy, but you could tell like, through the graininess, like the the detail and the sharpness in the fur, and it's it was incredible. Yeah, so I'm I'm really excited to to play more with that lens. Nice, nice. Discovering a whole new thing with macro. Yeah, yeah. I, f- I feel like most of what I'm going to use it for isn't necessarily macro. It's going to be more of like taking pictures that are within four feet of me. Yeah. Well, that's something you couldn't do before, so it's pretty cool. Yep. Yep. So um, the other thing is like, and we're not even supposed to be talking about this, but the the bokeh on that macro because of like all the things they had to do to make it a macro lens it's all really cat eye and swirly and people compare it a lot to like those russian vintage lenses mm, uh, yeah. kind of like the helios or whatever and so uh, i really wanted to get try getting some like bokeh shots or go do like christmas lights or something yeah and and kind of get and see how it looks because i kind of like really stylized character type lenses mm-hmm. um i mean like you know technically accurate you know perfect you know whatever 85 1.2 Boca Master lenses or whatever. Boca Master. Yeah. Um, but I also like lenses that have a lot of character, and I'm very interested in seeing what this 80 can do with background blur. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's funny. It's like another thing that that lens isn't really advertised for, but it'd be cool to see how it works. Yeah. It's like if you're looking for a portrait lens that provides traditional portrait look, this is super not what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. But it kind of is exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> Welcome back to the Camera Gear Podcast. I'm Daniel. And I'm Lucas. And we're back to talk more about the gear side of photo and video. Daniel. Yes, Lucas. Have you heard about the Canon EOS R6 Mark II? Well, you know, I've heard more about it than I have about the Nikon Z7. Because we didn't even know that that camera existed. (laughs) Um, Which, some may argue, that could be the biggest competitor to this camera. Interesting. I mean, and by some, I mean, I, it, it's me. I would I would argue that <laughs> if you're shooting photo, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe but the, the if you're black, shooting photo. I the, don't know. The black sheep win here is the uh, Nikon Z7 Mark II. I feel like I've heard more people compare it to the Sony a7 IV, but I don't know. I'm just I'm saying. I'm curious to hear where this goes. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's, let's dig into it, right? They announced this camera in early November. It came out late November, early December, and right now you can still not buy it because it's out of stock everywhere. Classic. Yeah, so you know, traditional camera, whatever. So we are we are you know, perfectly you know in in sync here as far as getting ahead of all the reviews because mm. no one has it because you can't get it. There you go. And uh, yeah, I think it's a great time to talk about it. Sounds good. So whenever I first saw this come through, it looked to me more like a uh, like a small spec bump and not really a big deal. Yeah, yeah. But like the more I dig into it, it, it kind of seems like it's pretty good pretty good option yeah they it seems like they changed more than we thought they did which was maybe a good thing because i feel like when the r6 came out it seemed like it was okay but i remember kind of being a little underwhelmed with it i guess yeah and so maybe they finally gotten it to a point where it's something that people would be interested in yeah it looks like some of the changes that they made were things like i mean they took i don't remember if the other one had a uh time limit on the video shooting but that's gone and uh, it seems like there's not really an overheating issue. I know that was kind of more of an R5 thing, but it seemed like, especially with the R5, but the R5 and the R6, you shoot, you know, you're oversampled 4K, mm-hmm. uh, which is like significantly better looking than the line skipped 4K in these cameras. And it was like, you, you just eventually you run out of, run out of like heat load in the camera. Right, it it right. shuts down, you turn it back on. And it's like, oh, you got 13 minutes left to record time or real if you're going to overheat again. And so it's this one, it seems like, you know, people are shooting 4K 60 for like 45 minutes plus. Wow. And it's not it's not overheating. And then uh, 
basically no heat problems in like 4K 30, 4K 24. That's great. So it's got some good video specs then. Yeah, it actually has some pretty pretty decent video specs. So with the with the previous version, I think it was the it might have been like the 4K 30 or the 4K 60 had a small crop to it, or it was like 4K 60 was APS-C only, and then mm-hmm. like 4K 30 had a small crop. I think that sounds familiar. And then for for this for this new new sensor new camera, I mean it's there's no cropping. You can shoot up to 4K 60 full width on the sensor wow. oversampled. That's great. I think. I feel like it is oversampled. Is it oversampled up to 4K 60? I know it is oversampled up to 4K 30. Yeah, it's 422 10 bit. 4K up to 60 frames per second oversample. That's pretty impressive. Oh no, wait, I'm now unsure again. You you lying to us again? Eh, who knows? We'll just assume. Let's just go with it. Cool. I'm trying to think of a full frame, another full frame camera that can shoot 4K 60 uncropped. That's like in this price bracket. Does the Sony A7 IV do it, or is it cropped? No, it crops. Okay. And 4K 60 is APS-C on the A7 IV. Once you go up into like your stack stuff, if you're shooting like with the uh, the Sony A1. You can shoot everything on crop. Well, sure. That's a $6,000 camera, though. Yeah, right. So, like, ignoring those super cameras, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything that has these video specs in full frame. Well, what about the Nikon Z7 Mark II? No, not even that one. Man, not even that one. Yeah. Well, that's so much of the best camera, I guess. But, I mean, the the video stuff seems pretty decent. It's still your standard, like, sensor readout. They're not doing any, like, crazy 14-bit readout stuff. It can't output RAW over HDMI, but it's like a mini HDMI. Okay. Unfortunately. That's still pretty good, though. It's nice that you can do that. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to have the feature. It's just mm. could have picked a better port, I yeah, guess. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like it has a C-Log 3 as well. That's yep. Yeah. Nice. I was looking, uh, I was trying to figure out what's the big deal with this C-Log 3 situation. And it seems like C-Log 2 has more dynamic range, which I believe this also has C-Log 2. C-Log 3 gives you... Um, it gives you less range in the shadows. Like okay. It brings it up maybe a, a half a stop or a stop. Mm-hmm. But as a result, you have less noisy shadows. Because like in C-Log 2, all that extra dynamic range is just noise for shadow stuff. Mm-hmm. And so C-Log 3 is kind of a, a good balance of like if you know you're not going to do a ton of post-processing and you're really just going to slap a LUT on it and, you know, make put a look in there or something. Yeah. Then... You know, C-Log 3 is really good, really good in between for a lot, between like C-Log 1 and C-Log 2. Okay. So cool. it's, it's really nice to see that added in. I know they've added the switch on it now too to switch between uh, photo and video. Yeah, that's uh, going to be annoying for everybody. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of people have muscle memory on the way that Canon's normally done it. And I guess now they've switched it to have this switch. But Right. I mean, I mean it's it, been different for all Canon stuff, but like for the R6 and R5, it's where the video switch was on the left, and then they moved it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I can see why that would be annoying, but it, at the same time, it's nice to have a fast way to switch between those. I mean, imagine a situation where you're you're like a photographer or videographer, and you have one Mark Mark One R6, and then you buy the Mark Two, so you can have two cameras to do two camera stuff. You're just constantly going to be turning your camera off, just video mode all the time, yeah. or always flipping it off. <laughs> I kind of like the way that they did it on the R5C where the video mode is, you know, between the two where you're like, you're in video and then you have to go to off and then go to photo and it's like on both sides of it. And then like whenever you go into the menus, you're like a full video menu or full photo menu and mm-hmm. it completely breaks those two parts of the camera apart. I think that's kind of cool, though. Maybe my, my most preferred version of it is what the X-H2S does and the X-H2, which is like you have seven custom modes and any of those custom modes can be a video mode or a photo mode. And then you don't have to worry about like, am I in video or photo? It's just, you know, C4 through C7 are all my video ones. I think I agree with that. I mean, the X-H2S has some annoyances with the way it does those custom modes. I think it's kind of silly that you have to explicitly set whether the custom mode is photo or video. Sure. But yeah, I mean, I, I like having custom modes. And I think the R6 does have a couple a couple of custom modes on the dial. Yeah, I think it's got a couple. Like you can't, because they moved the video thing to a switch uh, versus what they did previously like some workflows that people have on the on the R5 is you can program, you know, video mode to a button, mm-hmm. to a custom button. And so you just hit whatever function to and it switches you to video. Yeah. And I can't do that. You have to use the switch. So okay. I see. Could be annoying for some people. Could mm-hmm. not. But overall, the video specs are, they're pretty decent. I mean, you're getting 422 10-bit internal. You're not getting any like ProRes or anything because it doesn't have fast enough cards. It supports UHS-2 and it's got two card slots, which is nice. But I mean, you're not going to they're going to get like ProRes internal or whatever. I was a little disappointed to not have CF Express on there. Yeah, I never would have thought that I would care about that before. And I feel like I would have said I definitely want two SD slots, but 
now that I've used CF Express, I really like it. I like how fast it is. And I like that I can just have this huge card in my camera. And so I kind of wish the R6 had that. It does kind of feel like a miss. Like here's you know, faster, faster photo, faster video, you know, better write speeds and that sort of thing could probably benefit this camera. It seems like it's it's maxing up against what you could do with a V60 UHS-2 card. Yeah, yeah, it does. I would imagine that, I haven't looked up at the codex, but I would expect it's, you know, 400 megabit per second, you know, probably at the top end, mm -hmm. which is still pretty good for video. I think that the video capabilities out of this are going to be good for, you know, what most people need. Yeah, I think so too. When the R6 came out, that was back when I had the GH5 and the USR, and I did consider selling both of those and getting an R6 mm -hmm. and using it as my only camera. And I didn't do it because it seemed like the video specs just weren't quite up to snuff. It didn't seem like it would fully replace what I was using the right. GH5 for. But with the specs on the Mark II, I mean, it seems like I probably could have done that and been fine. Yeah, you probably could have. And it's got a lot of really good, a lot of really good numbers to it, right? I mean, they have like a 40 frames per second electronic photo burst mode, right? And that's up from 20 from the previous previous body. That, that's really good for a full frame camera which means that the, the rolling shutter performance is probably fairly decent. Yeah, I was curious on the rolling shutter because I know that's something that the Sony struggle with. Uh, you know, full frame, trying to shoot video, seems like that's a problem. I would expect this is slightly improved over maybe something like the A7R4. Wait, well, yeah, definitely that one, but the A7 IV. Mm -hmm. the, it, is, it is a totally new sensor. I think this one's coming in at like 26 megapixels. I think it's 24 maybe, mm. something like that. So I guess like if you're if you're looking for resolution at this price point, the A7 IV is 30 megapixels. Yeah, I mean, I was a little disappointed at that resolution because even the X-H2S has a higher resolution or the same. I, th I think this I think the R6 Mark II is 24 megapixels. Yeah, it's it's just a little little more in the 2S. It's 40 in the X-H2. Mm -hmm. It's 30 in the A7 IV. I mean, it's the Canon EOS R was 30 megapixels. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are okay with that general resolution, but it seems like, you know, it, it would have been nice to have a little more. Though yeah, it's just a little under what you would expect in a full frame sensor, mm -hmm. if you like. And then on top of that, it's a front side illuminated sensor instead of backside. Mm -hmm. We're used to seeing most cameras in this price point coming in with backside illuminated sensors, which like I don't know how much you know about that, but it's basically like you have a chip with um with like the photodiodes and your circuitry on it. And previously, they would put the circuitry between like the micro lenses and the photo sites. And backside is where they take the photo sites and they just put it on the back of the of the, of the chip. Okay. And so hmm. what that means is like you have more room for the photo sites with a backside illuminated sensor compared to the exact same size front side illuminated sensor. And so like the noise performance all seems great. It looks like a, you know, really good images. But if they had gone with like a backside solution for this resolution, they could have made those photo sites bigger which means better noise performance. I see. Now, how does that compare to a stacked sensor? Is this sensor stacked or is it not? Oh, it's not stacked. I don't think that you're going to see anything that's stacked below the $4,000 price point. For, uh, a full, for a full for frame. A, for a full frame, right. Mm -hmm. um, XH2S obviously being the exception. And the OM1 DRM. Well, yeah. those aren't full frame. Right. Not full frame wise, though. I mean, you're talking Alpha 1. Okay. Uh, EOS R3. You know, it's still it's still just too expensive to do mm. to do that. So okay. I just I was kind of surprised, you know, to not see backside. It's probably fine. The ISO performance on this is really good. Like you can shoot 100 up to um, 102,400, which I think is one. It's one third of a stop better or maybe it's one full stop. It's one full stop better than the A7R4. Ah, I keep doing that. The A7 IV. So that's pretty impressive. That is pretty impressive. Yeah. And I guess rolling shutter seems like it's not that bad. And mm -hmm. Canon's autofocus is always good. So those are kind of some of the other benefits you normally would see from a stack sensor. So even though this doesn't have it, it seems like it's not it's not hurting it that much. No, not really. I think that, you know, you're getting these great burst photos at 40 frames per second. I mean, whatever they're, whatever they're doing with the processor and how they're reading out that sensor it's not missing being stacked. And with the ISO performance, it's not missing being backside. It's like they'd be able to take a cheaper sensor, make it work better, and then charge more for the camera. Well, there you go. How can you go wrong with that? Exactly. Especially if you're Canon. Yeah. So uh, it looks like the, the 1080 on it, you can shoot up to 180 frames per second. So a little better slow-mo, which is kind of cool. You know, no crop shooting 180. And then it's not oversampled, unfortunately. So you can only shoot oversampled in 4K. Okay. Uh, which to me, that's a little frustrating. I would, I guess like it makes, it makes sense. You don't want to necessarily oversample all the way down to 1080, but sometimes you just want to shoot 1080. You don't want to always want to shoot 4k for like file size or, you know, whatever, but the 1080 is, is, is only line skipped. Mm. 
So, yeah, I don't know. I, I bet more and more people are shooting 4K now, so it's probably not as big of a deal. Yeah. I guess you probably wouldn't necessarily notice line skip 1080 as much as you would 4K, but that's, I mean, that's a lot of pixel jumps. I mean, you're just skipping now every fourth pixel or something in the resolution. Yeah, that is a lot. I'm, I'm curious if you'd see it, you know, like if you had something that was sufficiently detailed, would that start to be a problem? I don't know. Hard to say. It, it seems like the way that these cameras were meant to be shot is in the oversampled modes. And to be fair, if you're buying something like an R6, you're probably not shooting 1080p video all that much. I mean, you probably want the most resolution you can get, the nicest picture you can get. I don't know. I think it's probably fine, but I can see why it's a little frustrating. Yeah. So, I mean, overall, seems like a pretty good camera. It has IBIS in it. It still has that dumb wobble issue that oh, all really? like all the Canon IBIS cameras have. I don't know why it's only Canon. But for, like I don't know if it's the distance to the flange or how they're doing their IBIS, but hmm. it seems like from the reviews I was looking at, the in general like the shooting with it, if you're you know panning and that sort of thing, it's really really good. But if you flip that puppy around and you have a wide angle lens on it, you're gonna get that crazy corner hmm. wobble. Yeah, and they just can't seem to they can't seem to fix it. Yeah, that's a shame. I, I don't know what the deal would be with that either, but. I mean, I imagine all these manufacturers have different algorithms for the stabilization. I mean, it's probably like a trade secret or a oh, patent for sure. or whatever. So I guess Canon just hasn't figured it out. Or maybe they feel like there's this optimized for some other uses and it just happens to not be great for that. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, maybe it is an optimization thing. It could be that it could be that it's maybe better at, you know, some of the yaw changes in the... In the right, that's know. kind of what I was thinking. So, yeah, I don't know. Hard, hard to say, but... Overall, you know, pretty good, pretty good upgrade. I was kind of curious to see, you know, how obviously we don't have any like performance on this specific camera. And whenever you go and you look at Canon's website, they are they are aggressive with their dynamic range listings. They're like, oh, yeah, this uh, C70 has 16 stops of dynamic range. <laughs> Classic. And then yes. you go look at like, you know, Cine D's, you know, dynamic range Xyla testing and, and they're like, the best camera you can buy is 16.3. <laughs> so I'm like, man. Yeah, but I feel like all the manufacturers do that. Oh, they definitely do that. And what, I mean, what they're reporting is like total readable stops regardless yeah, like no of matter, noise. Yeah, no matter how noisy it is. Mm -hmm. Like if you, if you can see one pixel of that stop, then they're calling it that. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a little aggressive. And so I was, I was kind of looking at this list on, on Cine's website and I just, I keep being really impressed at the EOS uh, C70. That camera is so capable. <laughs> I mean, all those Canon cinema cameras, it's funny because you look at the specs of them, like in terms of the sensor size or whatever, and they don't really sound that impressive. I mean, cameras like the C200 that, that people have talked about for a long time, the sensors are not that great. I mean, something, you know, some consumer level camera beats them in, in raw specs, but it kind of shows you that you can't just look at specs to get everything because people have loved those cameras for a long time because they just have a certain look to them. And I feel like the C70 is kind of on that level. It seems like a lot of people just really like the image they get out of that camera. Yeah. And it's like, you, you compare the dynamic range of the C70 to something like, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollar, Airy Alexa. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, this is 14 and that one's 15 or 16. And in like in the test from Cine D, I mean, it's it's number six on their list as far as, you know, dyna ranked dynamic range performance. And that's, it's a it's a super 35 <laughs> sensor. And what is it like fifty five hundred dollars, something like that? Yeah, it's like fifty five hundred bucks. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I, I think about like the R6 and like what Canon's doing with that and like, oh, it's a full frame. So it's going to be better with noise or it's going to be better with, uh, you know, dynamic range and all this stuff. And it's like, well, actually, it's not even better than than their, you know, C70 camera, <laughs> which is Super 35. Yeah. Interesting and, how that works. Yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how this one's going to rank in with everything. Mm -hmm. But based upon, you know some of the early testing and it not being it not being backside illuminated and it not being stacked and and doing you know just standard 12-bit readout for video or 10-bit readout for video i'm not not sure which it's probably going to come in you know right about where everybody else is for these it's going to be 12 or 13 stops probably 13 uh with like a signal to noise ratio of two so yeah. that's what i would i would bet yeah, I mean, it's like all these cameras now are more than sufficient for normal projects. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're making YouTube videos or you're making, you know, a short film or something, I mean, something like this is probably going to be just fine. It's going to be just as good as any other camera that's, you know, modern, similar price range and all that. I mean, it's not going to be on the level of a C70, maybe not even an R5C, but it'd be, it, it sure sounds like it can stand up to most of the competition. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, having just worked through that project with the XH2S footage and messing with that, you know, 422 10-bit and, and grading through it, 
I outputted to 8 bit and I outputted to 10 bit. And like you, you can tell the difference. And so having a full frame option that can shoot video, you know, is, is a good hybrid camera and that like you're not getting any cropping, you're getting that full sensor width and you're getting 422 10 bit. I mean, it's, it's pretty compelling. I'm not really seeing anything else that's doing that. I mean, even the A7 IV, it doesn't quite meet those video specs. Yeah. Well, it's cool that Canon kind of, you know, came from behind a little bit in this part of the market. And I mean, it seems like, like you said, this competes and it beats the Sony in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely does. And, you know, I'm kind of curious, like where this, where this ends up as far as Canon's line, because they're pricing this thing, at, I think like 26 or $2,700, depending upon like if where you see it on sale and where you don't. Okay. And that feels pretty expensive to me. I think the other one, the R6 Mark One, was 25 or 26 So like mm-hmm. they're not really raising the price. Yeah. But it feels like there's this chasm in their lineup. Well, what I mean, what else do they have? I guess like where does it fit? So like I, I took all their cameras and like I ranked them by price. And it, everything that they make that's RF mount that they currently sell. And like at the very bottom, you have your R10, which is like $800, $900. Okay, and that's, that's APS-C, and that's right? that's APS-C. They still sell the RP, which is $1,000, and that's 26 megapixels full frame. That's still a really good deal, in my opinion. Though I would probably buy a Z6 Mark I from Nikon well, I mean, for the same price. <laughs> now you're basically a Nikon fanboy. So Okay, so you can get a used Mark Z7 Mark II for $2,300, $2,600. It's, it's cheaper than this new Canon R6 Mark II. All right. I'm going to let you talk about Nikon, but let's finish this run through of Canon's lineup. And then I'll let you talk about Nikon, <sighs> but, Ni- Nikon podcast. But this, it provides context. So this two-year-old camera has a 46 megapixel sensor and like all the used lenses you could ever want for cheaper and like even their new lenses are like a thousand dollars less than the canon lenses i mean every time you go to the camera store they basically offer to pay you to take them off their hands yeah, they exactly. don't have any room on the shelves for any more nikon lenses it's exactly what happens yeah. and so like as far when you look at purely photo specs the z7 mark ii is equivalent or better than the r6 mark ii I know it's like two years old, but it was the two-year-old top of the line, right? It's, it's yeah. their comparison to the R5. And so it's like, I don't know. I mean, that seems like a better buy to me. Yeah, maybe so. Anyway, so that's, that's like context for you know these prices. Okay. The R7, the Canon R7 is 1500 and that's 32 megapixels. So more resolution, faster readouts, APS-C. Okay. So that one, that, that's like their high-end APS-C. Right. And oh, and remember, Canon APS-C is 1.6 crop. Mm, so it's like, it's smaller it's than smaller. Fuji APS-C. Mm-hmm. And Sony and basically everybody else. Tiny old Canon sensors. Anyway, EOS R, 1700, 30 megapixels. And then the R6, 2600, 24 megapixels. And then it's 3700 for the R5, 4000 for the R5C, 5500 for the C70, and then 6,000 for the R3. I mean, basically, once you get past the USR, it just seems like the the line spreads out. Yeah, it's like there's this just this gap. It's like everything that's less than 2,000 bucks, it's like all you, you know, fake camera people, and then everything above that for all you real camera people. Yeah, yeah. And like, I'm just like, where is that? Like, the R is whatever, four years old now, they're going to stop selling it at any point in time. You know, we talked about this the other day, a, a few episodes ago, about whether the R was still worth buying, and... I mean, it, it's a good camera and it, especially if you could get one used, I think that's worth it. But I mean, I wouldn't buy a new one at $1,700. If you, if you pretend that that's not in their line at all, then you can't get a 30 megapixel full frame camera. You're either getting 24 or 45. Mm-hmm. And the price is like a huge difference. Yeah. You're, you're going from a $1,500 APS-C camera to a 26 or $2,700 full frame camera. Mm-hmm. That is a, that's a huge gap. It is. And yeah. it's like what? It feels like there's supposed to be something there. And like the numbers make sense, right? It's like seven, six, five, but I don't know. Like there's no, there's no room between six and seven, but there's a room in the price bracket. And so I'm just curious, like what's, is Canon going to come out with something to replace the US R? Maybe so. Or, you know, or maybe they're planning on lowering the price of the R6 Mark II eventually. You know, maybe this is like the, the introductory price, but they're just knowing they're going to drop it. Because when the EOS R came out, it was pretty expensive. I mean, it was like $2,200 yeah. and now it's dropped 500 So maybe they're just leaving room for that. But yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I felt like, like the R6, uh, what they offer makes sense for that price. I don't think that camera needs to be cheaper. Mm-hmm. But in like going through all the specs and looking at this camera and like imagining myself as like a 
like an R6 Mark II user or oh, man, whatever. Your life would be completely different. Totally different. Uh, for one, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to afford any of the lenses. Because <laughs> I'm like, they close off the RF mount. And so like you can buy the adapter and put all your EF class on it. But like you don't get the advantage of, of those close the close flange distance. The R, RF mount has more pins. And so like you get more autofocus data and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so like the R, RF lenses are just, they're just better yeah. than whenever you mount them on an RF camera. But you can't buy, you can only buy Canon RF mm-hmm. lenses. And man, this it's not great. When I had the EOS R, I would have loved to have bought more RF lenses. But I, you know, like I would have loved to have had an RF L series lens just to keep on the camera, have, you know, a standard zoom or something. But the RF 24 to 70 was so expensive. It was just unrealistic to buy that. The 24 to 105 F4 is $1,300. Yeah. And that's like a basic lens. That feels like a kit lens yeah. for a full frame camera. Well, they have they have the kit version of that, which is the 24 to 105 F4 to F7.1. <laughs> and that one's $400. If you're buying a $2,600 camera, you should not be buying an F7.1 lens. No, not necessarily. I mean, that's like the whole reason you're getting, you're getting into full frame is to get that, you know speed mm-hmm. it's just it's it's frustrating because like the 24 7 2.8 that should be your staple lens it's 2500 bucks like, but that's where you should start if you're getting into rf when i had the usr i had the tamron ef mount 24 right. to 70 f 2.8 and i just used the adapter which didn't feel great but also that lens was like 1100 dollars, so it was like half the price of the rf version. yeah i know like in my head i know that full frame lenses are more expensive and i know that these red badged rf lenses are equivalent to like a g master Mm -hmm. Uh, and and maybe maybe sony people will shoot me for saying that but they're just it's so much i bought i bought the best sharpest 80 millimeter macro lens that fuji makes and brand new that thing's 1100 bucks yeah and like you compare that to you know an an 85 1.2 lens and that one's Mm -hmm. (laughs) 2900 dollars jeez I mean, it's just, it, that is a reason to shoot on APS-C. Everybody talks about full frame and liking the full frame look and all the YouTubers have it. But when you start trying to buy lenses, I think that maybe you get better image quality if you buy an APS-C camera and buy those top of the line lenses that are going to cost you 1000 or $1,200 maybe that's better than buying a full frame camera and then not really being able to afford that professional glass. And so you're getting like the kit lenses or the lower end stuff. And maybe you lose some of the benefits of the full frame. I think there's, I think there's an argument for that though. Maybe it's a matter of like you invest, you know, hardware money into this really expensive RF lens system. And then you're just like, you're really stuck there. Cause it's, I mean, you, I mean, you could probably sell them or that sort of thing, but it's, it gets kind of out of that price range of, you know, I'm going to sell a, a lens on Facebook for whatever, $2,500. <laughs> yeah, that's hard to imagine. I imagine it? that it's more difficult to move things in that price bracket. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm wrong. But to me, if I was getting into like into the RF lens ecosystem, I mean, there's some good options out there that are like the 50 millimeter 1.8 is $150. That's pretty cheap. The 85 F2 is $500. And that was a good lens. I had that mm-hmm. one. So like there's there's some options there where you can get you know, a couple zooms. You can get the, or a couple primes. You get the 24 1.8 for 600. So like maybe you spend $2,000, you get your, your three main primes, 24, 50, 85. And then you save up your bucks and you buy a zoom, either the 24 to one five or the, or the 24 to 70. But those are going to cost you anywhere between $1,300 and $2,400. I mean, there's just no getting around it. It's a, it's an expensive lens system to be in. I don't know. I can imagine, I can imagine myself with like, okay, you know, here's, here's the four lenses that I need. And it's, you know, five thousand dollars for that and then twenty six hundred for the camera and mm-hmm. whatever but you can imagine yourself spending seventy five hundred dollars on your camera setup i was thinking the other day of like how much all the lenses were and the mm-hmm. cameras that were in my bag because i had like the xt3 and the xh2s plus like three lenses it's pretty close to that sometimes it's best to not think about it <laughs> yeah some, sometimes it is yeah so i don't know I, I feel like that's the biggest attraction for me this EOS R6 Mark II seems like a really good camera. It seems like some of the specs are class leading at that price point. But how do you go in and buy a $2,600 camera and then you can't use it until you buy a $2,900 lens? <laughs> it's, it's a lot of money, that's mm-hmm. for sure. I mean, you can get the adapter and you can use EF glass that you may already have. And if you're going to adapt anything, at least that's adapting Canon to Canon. So it's not as bad. Yeah, yeah. I just, I think that you go out and you buy a Z7 Mark II for, you know, $2,500 and then you buy a 24 to 70 F4 for like $800 and you're, you're all set. 
you got a 45 megapixel full frame camera and you're out the door full, you know, barely over $3,000. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper. That's for sure. It doesn't quite have the same video specs. Only shoots 420 because it's still in, you know, a couple, a couple years ago where, you know, the main thing was getting 10 bit, whether it be 4, 420 or or whatever right and we're going to weren't seeing a lot of that 422 10 bit that was internal you can get it external on the mm-hmm. on the z7 mark ii okay which maybe like maybe, that's maybe okay. you're okay with shooting externally yeah you can probably do raw on it i imagine right yeah sure can i don't know man seems like a better buy to me and you said that used you can get it for a little bit cheaper than the r6 mark ii yeah i mean kind of depends on what deals you've seen i've seen it for almost under two thousand. yeah i mean that that does sound like a really good deal for a 45 megapixel full frame camera yeah for sure so that's, I don't know, it was kind of my conclusion coming out of this was like, the OS R6 seems really, really good, but if you don't need that extra one, like if you're shooting video and you don't need that extra one stop of noise performance that you get out of just having a full frame, like an X-H2S is right there at the same price point, but all the lenses are a half to a third the cost brand new. Mm-hmm. I mean, most of my lenses I bought for Fuji, even like the really good ones are, have been between 800 and a thousand dollars. Yeah. I honestly think most of the people that would be interested in this R6 Mark II are Canon shooters. Yeah. I, I think mean, that, that makes they, total sense. I think they like the ergonomics of it. They're used to the menus. They like the colors they get and they may already have lenses that they can use. I mean, I think those are all good reasons to buy a camera like this. Yeah. I mean, I guess it helps that it still feels like Canon leads the market as far as, you know, top camera brands and they're making their own sensors and making their own lenses. They're forcing you to buy them uh, because you can't, you can't buy RF for anyone else. Mm -hmm. But I don't feel like they're pulling anybody over from, from like Sony or from Fuji or from Nikon. I mean, maybe they are, but like the cost of all this stuff, it's, and you can go, there's so many good E-mount lenses. Yeah. And there's so many good third party ones where if you want to spend $3,000 $3,000 on a 70 to 200 or $3,500 on 70 to 200 and get like the best of the best. The G master is right there. But if you don't, there's a Tamron or a Sigma offering that is, you know, half the price that mm-hmm. works, you know, as yep. about as good, maybe less sharp, yep. maybe more chromatic aberration. And like, because of that, Sony seems more appealing. Sony's always going to have the better specs, you know, not maybe not quite the case here with the a seven four versus, you know, the R six, but I don't know. I feel it feels like there's more more of an inclination inclination for you to want to switch off of Canon to Sony than from Sony to Canon. And then everyone forgot Nikon existed or else <laughs> they would they would have all bought all these Z7 Mark IIs. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what it seems like. I was going to say I think that Sony has more options too in in the lower price range. You know, if you're thinking about people switching camera systems, feel like you're not typically going to see somebody going from one $3,000 camera to a different $3,000 camera. I mean, sure that happens sometimes, but I feel like it's more common that somebody gets a, you know, a prosumer, you know, $1,500 camera and then they start thinking okay, is this something I want to take seriously? I think I want to switch to a different system. You know, I want to consider my needs more. I know what I need now. And so I feel like that's kind of the price point where you you want to have a lot of different models so people can choose from and decide exactly what they need. And like we were saying earlier, Canon just doesn't really have that. They don't really have something that, they don't really have choices for you in that range. Whereas something like Sony, you've got all kinds of different options. Yeah. Fuji, you have lots of options. And so, I don't know. I, I feel like Canon's not really giving people reasons to switch, but they're also not giving people things to switch to. Yeah, and I mean, that all makes total sense. It's just Canon is giving everybody what they need, right? Oh, you need a standard zoom? Here's a 2470. You need all your basic primes? Here's a fantastic 100 millimeter or 1.8 lens. Yes, they all cost over $2,000. And, but they like, and it's like your only option, you know, you're in Canon, you want this lens, here it is, here's how much it costs. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. And I guess that's working for them. It just seems, it doesn't really seem anti-consumer or anything necessarily, but it just seems very, I don't know, very Apple Yeah, in a way. Yeah. I've always felt like Canon and Apple had some similarities in terms yeah. of like platform lock-in and kind of like we provide the nicest experience, like that sort of mindset. And I mean, that that still holds basically true for Canon. I the like the menus are no one really complains about the Canon menus that much. And the bodies are built very well. It's an extremely premium camera brand. I feel like they have really ergonomic bodies. 
like when I pick up a Canon camera, it's just comfortable. All the buttons are in good spots. I mean, they do that really, really well. Yeah, I guess like what I'm bouncing around on a lot here is that I like Canon for all the stuff they do. I really like their cameras. Their lenses are fantastic. And oh, in general, like there's hard to find too many negative things to say about Canon. Mm -hmm. Maybe they go a little light on a spec because they want it to be more reliable and they want to have these like pro grade you know, systems that people are using for, for all these professional applications. And it's just that you pay for it and you really, like you really pay for it. Yeah. So I found on B&H a Z7 Mark II for $2,200. <laughs> are you going to buy it? I mean, and, it's pretty cheap. I mean, it was, it's cheaper than my uh, X-H2S. Maybe I should, maybe I should have reconsidered that yeah, before I just, bought it. Just roll that back. You could have gotten 10 lenses this year instead of the six or whatever exactly. that you bought. Especially if I had bought the, what is, what is, I don't even remember what the old mount is. N mount? F mount and F mount man. If I if I just like invested into F mount oh, and man. adapted it to my new Z7 Mark II, buy all those twenty five dollar <sighs> lenses they have at uh, the camera store. I probably could have had ten lenses and spent less than eight hundred dollars. <laughs> I mean, it's, how do you argue with that, right? Exactly. I don't, I'm telling you, man. We're, there's gonna be like a Nikon revolution or something. People are gonna figure it out. They're gonna be like, guys, you've never heard of this camera brand, but it's making a comeback. And be like, oh man, what is it? They're gonna click on the video. And it's like. Nikon. Oh, I've never heard of it. What's a Nikon? Let, let's talk about that for a second, though. Why do you think Nikon has fallen by the wayside so much? And I mean, what you've described with the Z7 Mark II, I mean, you're right. It does sound really compelling. It's got good specs. It's cheap. So what what gives? Why is nobody talking about that? Why were we surprised that it existed? I have a, I have a real answer, but I, I kind of want to say I don't know, but I kind of have I kind of have a hunch. But first, here's a Nikon Z 85 1.8 for $612. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a pretty good 17 to 28 f2 for uh, f2.8, $1,000. This is this is all you used on B&H. Here's a, a 24 to 70 f4, $400. I mean, <laughs> these are like Fuji lens prices. I, I, I I'm like you look at the lens man, it's like it's hard not to. Anyway, I think that I think that Sony is really good at marketing to the people who are in like where I would see things. I mean, that's why I don't see a ton of like Nikon, whatever, because I'm like watching YouTube and I'm, you know, on the internet and the internet places and on for, the internet, internet, internet places. Yeah. And for like all the, all the people who are hitting up the gram or smashing the t TikToks or however they say it, you know, and like posting to YouTube and writing on their blog channels, like Sony is like, I found you here's a camera that you can just play with for free for however long you want. Yep. Write something nice about it. Yep. Or let's let's invite 40 YouTubers to the mountains for a week. Yeah, exactly. They're like, do you guys want to come? We're paying for it. All, all hundred of you. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna do this thing. Yeah, their and, marketing budget must be insane. But they are they are just they're so good at engaging on that level where it feels like Nikon is run by people who who don't even have a Facebook account. And so like they're just they're just not engaged in that way and they're not marketing in that way. And so Sony was able to like step in, get this foothold. And then we have this this thing where it's like Windows, Apple, Android, iOS, Canon, Sony, right? Like you, like it's hard to keep more than a dichotomy of of like these brands and it's always like one versus the other and it feels like it's Canon versus Sony. I, I do I do feel like the camera market is more diverse. And I really like that about cameras. Is like you have your Olympuses and your Panasonics and your Nikons and your Fujis and your Canons and your Sonys. And yeah. there's so many great options. It's not really just two players, but some people do simplify it to that. And if you were going to simplify it, Sony booted Nikon out as, as the number two. And I think for that reason, like Sony has the mind share. And if you're doing an AB comparison, you're really only thinking about the Canon. And then people have just kind of forgot that, you know, Nikon was the DSLR brand. And if you were looking for a mirrorless full frame DSLR, the, the 850, the D850 was like one of the premier cameras that was made in the mid 2000s. Yeah. I don't think it was mirrorless, but mirrored camera yeah. D DSLR. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was buying my first fancy camera when I was, uh, I guess it was like. 2007 or something 2008 mm -hmm. i mean at that point it was dslrs and it was like nikon or canon those were your choices and nikon seemed really good i went with a yep. nikon because it it seemed like a great choice and then yeah i think you're right i think it's just that the marketing's kind of fallen by the wayside and especially now with people doing all this video stuff 
it just seems like they don't really think about Nikon as an option, which is surprising because Nikon has good video specs now. Yeah, they have decent video specs. They they definitely they compete. And you know, back in the day, whenever the like digital cameras were coming out, you know, Nikon's like we have 14 bit readout for our photos, and Canon was 12 bit for the longest time. Yeah. And it's like you have these have more data in the files, and typically their cameras are cheaper. But people still gravitate to Canon because Canon's Canon, mm-hmm. and Canon has kept up decently with that marketing i feel like sony's in the lead on the marketing front but canon has somehow held their position i wonder if another part of it it comes down to manufacturers versus resellers in a way like canon makes their whole stack they make their sensors yeah as far as i understand it sony makes their sensors nikon uses sony sensors fuji uses sony sensors basically everyone uses sony so maybe it's that they can't they can't lead on the specs because Sony's keeping the best sensors for themselves. Right. And all these other brands aren't able to do that. Maybe. Maybe. And then like maybe it's a matter of that because Canon owns their whole stack, they can make more money and then they can put that money into making more quality equipment or more marketing. That could be. And so like they just don't quite have they don't have the competitive edge in any aspect there. Yeah. Right. They make really good stuff and like they're making their own lenses and, and they're really good lenses. They're just not they're not that in the same you know level of the manufacturing as like Nikon or yeah. Canon and Sony. That's true. Maybe that's what it is. But it is interesting. Like when you I, I've never even considered buying a Nikon camera for video. But I mean, what you're saying, it's like, why would I not consider something like the Z7 Mark II? I don't know. It's kind of in the back of my mind. I don't think I'm ever going to buy a Nikon, <laughs> but I don't know. Pretty, you never know. Pretty appealing. Anything is possible. Anything's possible. I guess, uh, you know, we, we just got to keep talking about it. You know, we got to bring, bring the yep. Nikon yep. back. Yeah, it's starting here. Yeah. N- Nikon podcast. This is the Nikon revolution. <laughs> and, uh, you know, next year with the with the Z8 or the Z7 Mark III, which could already be out. It could. I, we really don't know. No idea. Yeah. I mean, when you say something like Z8, it almost sounds like C8. And then I'm like, maybe it's a Corvette. But <laughs> I don't know. I mean, there. I think there might be an overlap in the people who buy Corvettes and the people who use Nikon they're, cameras. They're probably about the same age. Yeah, that seems right. Yeah. Oh boy. So that's it, I guess. You know, it's. I think that the so the C70 is still maybe one of the better better video cameras you can buy, and it's definitely at the top of the line for uh, for Canon and uh, you know it's APS-C. Which obviously, I and mean, the conclusion here is that APS-C Super 35 is the better better sensor size for uh i mean apparently for video so. cameras yeah. and if you were looking for a super 35 camera with the best video specs it's going to be an xh2s <laughs> so i think that that concludes our conversation on the xh2s i, I feel yeah i feel like you uh you took a, a few jumps in logic there <laughs> but but you do have a reputation to uphold so yeah, I'm sure had, to, had to tie that in a little bit <laughs> yep now, I don't know. I I think that the R6 Mark II is going to be really good for uh, for Canon shooters. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad to see it. I think they made some good upgrades here. Like I said, I was a little underwhelmed with the original R6, but I feel like they've bumped it up enough now that it makes sense at that price point. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, I think we uh, we've just about covered that. You got anything else? Man, I, I mean, we could talk about the battery that's in it. We could talk about the false color. Huh? Yeah, it does have it's false color. Pretty, pretty Can- neat. Canon's finally giving uh, cinema features to their non-cinema cameras. Still turns off the waveform whenever you record, but because, because that makes perfect sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. can shoot uh, in uh, in Heath, which is neat. Neat that ca- cameras are starting to do that. Yeah, but ba- ba- basically that's it. That's all I got. That's going to do it for the show today. Thanks for joining us, and if you enjoyed it, we'd encourage you to rate us on iTunes and tell your photography friends about the show. Also, check out our website at cameragearpodcast.com to learn more or send us feedback and questions. We'll be back with more next week.